Thanks, Christine. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad that we can have a nice crowd out for our forestry panel discussion this morning. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to facilitate the conversation about global leadership in sustainable forest management. Uh, as we've heard, we know that you know 2019 in particular has been a challenging year in the industry, but there's still absolutely a lot of commitment and passion to the industry, and I think what one thing that the industry does share across the board is a belief in the sustainable value of the industry going forward. So I think it's a very timely conversation to have today. On behalf of the panel, I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional territories of the Clay Clay Tenay, and we're very pleased to uh, be here on their lands today. Before I turn things over to our panelists today, let me just introduce each of them very briefly. Uh, so Chief Willie Sellers is with the Williams Lake Indian Band. He's been on council since 2008 and was elected chief in 2018. Uh, a fact that you might not know about Chief Sellers is that he is also a published author. He has one book out and I believe a second book coming out this spring. <laughs> uh, Next to Chief Sellers is Bob Simpson. He's the mayor of Quinell and has been mayor since 2014. Before that, he served two terms as MLA for Caribou North. And he also has experience in the, in the forest sector, previously working for Weldwood Canada. Uh, next to Mayor Simpson is Shannon Jansen, who is the vice president and chief forester of Western Forest Products. Her role includes championing sustainable forestry practices that contribute to healthy forests and a vibrant industry. Shannon brings a track record of success in achieving solutions that balance social, environmental, and economic goals to her role, which also includes leading the company's partnerships with Indigenous nations. Uh, and as another note for Shannon, she actually also has the notable distinction of being the first woman to be named chief forester of a major forestry company. And our final panelist is Kurt Nickaday. He's the Vice President and Chief Economist with the BC Council of Forest Industries, also known as Kofi. Uh, he is also an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. Prior to joining Kofi last year, Kurt was with the Bank of Canada, and before that he led a team of research economists with the Canadian Forest Service. So we're going to start with some brief opening comments from each of the panelists, and then we will be looking to take some questions from the pigeonhole uh, and have part of a uh, vibrant conversation as we talk about sustainable forest management. So with that, I will turn it over to Chief Sellers. <clears throat> Good morning. Juki uh, Nuk is a common welcome in the morning. Uh, from the Sequim Nation, and it, it means uh, we survive the night. Uh, those words always ring true to me when you hear the backstory on on how that term was used and how it was coined with First Nations people in my community, the Sequim Nation. Because of those days, uh, they would greet each other with that greeting um, when they would wake up in the residential school. Um, you know, it's a very powerful statement considering how blessed they were to be able to survive the night in those instances because of just what was going on in their lives at the time. That was a way of life and it was just a way of um, making light of the situation, I guess. Way ho wait up, cook beat Willie Sellers runs quest. To Gekel Sequep Mulu, hello, my name is Chief Willie Sellers from Williams Lake Indian Band of the Sequep Nation. I'm uh, very thankful to be a part of the panel uh, today. You know, Williams Lake is a it's a resource-based economy. It's mining, it's forestry, the downtown <coughs> economy, and looking at how we uh, can better look at sustainability in forestry is, is uh, something that's on the top of, of, of my mind as a leader in my community. We have a forestry company at the Williams Lake Indian Band, Borland Creek Logging, and we harvest approximately 150,000 cubes of timber per year. And when we start looking at the AEC coming down and um, the downturn in the forestry economy and, and big business moving away, we start, you know, re-looking at how we diversify that economy in Williams Lake. Uh, you know, we're doing it through a, through a variety of different ways, of course, but uh, it's conversations like this, um, partnerships, I think is a big way of how we're going to do that. So I guess I forgot to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Clay Clay Tanay, and um, those little things like that, I really mean a lot to a First Nation leader 
uh, each and every single one of the panelists and the speakers are, are, are doing that and it, it really strikes you know those heartstrings and, and um, you know allows me and other First Nation leaders to hold their heads up high when they're conducting business in those um, neighboring communities and even in our communities in general so uh, looking forward to the conversations today and looking forward to hearing the insight of the panelists um, you know I asked to speak before Mayor Bob Simpson because he's uh, very well versed in how he speaks and he's you know given me um, a briefings on how to be better so I'm just trying to be better and speaking before him uh, hopefully um, set the tone for what he's gonna have to say. So. <laughs> Well, Chief, I think you're doing a very good job. <laughs> and with that, over to Mayor Simpson. Thanks. I, I joked on our conference call that the only reason Willie really wanted to go first is he's the good-looking young guy and he gets to get it over with. Um, so uh, it, it, the question we've been asked to speak to is, is sustainable forest management writ large. And I've been involved in forestry for a very long time in various roles. And I have to say, I, I think it's a great question. I don't have an answer. So I asked Siri. <laughs> <laughs> and after I finally got Siri to understand the question that I was asking, <clears throat> up pops a bunch of commentary and a bunch of language around the mantra, I think, that we've told ourselves in British Columbia. And that mantra goes something along the lines of, we only harvest 1% of the timber harvesting land base on any given year. We plant three trees for every tree we cut down. Uh, we have the most certified land base in the world. We're a world leader in sustainable forest management. That's the mantra. The problem with that, though, is it isn't our lived experience. Uh, I'm the mayor of uh, one of BC's uh, most forest-dependent communities. And if we talk about sustainable forest management, you can't delink that from sustainable communities. So our communities continuing to get a benefit, a derivative benefit from managing our forests sustainably. Well, we just lost 200 permanent jobs this year. Uh, in 2014, we saw Canfor go away. In 2019, we saw Toco go away. Uh, we have fewer jobs uh, from managing that resource than we've ever had. We just lost another $400,000 of our tax base. Uh, so are we returning sustainable long-term returns to our communities? Well, I think the answer to that is that's diminishing over time. I was in Clearwater on Saturday. I see the mayor of Hunter Mile House is here, the mayor of Williams Lake, you know, ask that question on sustainability at the community level. I think the answer is we're on a declining return. Uh, Chief Sellers is here representing uh, First Nations, not just the Williams Lake Indian Band, but writ large. And I think the First Nations communities would answer the question, we haven't gotten a fair shake from sustainably managing our forests for a very long time. From an economic perspective, because ec the economic benefits also have to be sustainable, uh, it begs the question of if we're managing our force sustainably so that our economic benefits are sustainable as well, then why is the BC sector in a full meltdown with industry rationalization, mill closures, both permanent and temporary, across the board, and complaints about the cost regime uh, is just too high for us to be economic uh, in the world uh, market? And then the final piece and the one that really is kind of the heart of the main question around planting trees and certification is are we managing the land base sustainably? Well, I would like to take you in Dunkley's helicopter, if Dunkley will let me get you up there, and fly over the land base uh, west of Quenelle. And as I say to our environmental friends, all their static reserves, ungulate winter range, caribou habitat, all of those things are the same as where the timber management areas are, black, dead, burnt, pest ridden. Uh, is that sustainable forest management? That land base is completely blown out. And we can't just blame that on climate change, which some people are suggesting, because we know that years of fire suppression set that landscape up to be so greatly disturbed. 
fire suppression is part of our forest management regime. So we have to take some responsibility for that. So I think it is a great question. I think it is a question begged, and I don't think that simple answers like we plant three trees for every one we cut down are the kinds of answers that are satisfactory to the general citizenry in British Columbia. Thanks, Mayor Simpson. Great. Janet. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I didn't show up um, for the <laughs> session that allowed us to pick the sequence of, uh, of speakers, so oh. here I am. <laughs> Third on the list after Bob. Um, but Susan actually said as I came up to keep it optimistic, and you know, I, I have some notes here today to, to sort of reflect that. And I, I think reflecting on what you've said, um, looking at the point of the global aspect of sustainable forest management, um, I'm excited to be here today to talk about this topic, not only because I'm a forester and I'm really passionate about forestry, but there's also three other really pertinent reasons why this is an impor important topic for today and at this particular time in our history. Uh, one, Greta Thunberg. Two, Larry Fink. And three, Columbia. So these three seemingly disconnected reasons have one thing in common. They force us to look beyond our own backyard and they create a necessary context for global sustainability. So Greta Thunberg has raised awareness of climate crisis in a very short time frame, putting significant generational pressure on global leaders for meaningful uh, resolution to the climate crisis. Larry Fink very recently made climate change a tangible priority for business. For those unfamiliar with him, as I was just a few weeks ago, Larry Fink is the president and CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager with $6 trillion in holdings. And this January, in his letter to CEOs, he began to define tangible expectations and real expectations for climate uh, action for the firms in which he invests. And finally, Columbia. This one's more personal, as I had time to spend there this year, which I sadly experienced firsthand what can nearly be described as the tragedy of the commons. For those of you not familiar with the concept, the tragedy of the commons is an economic problem that results in overconsumption, underinvestment, and ultimately depletion of a common or a shared resource. It's almost always tied back to lack of clearly defined tenure rights, sometimes corruption, and ineffective and non-existent laws or structures that support the sustainable use. While it might not be true throughout the country of Colombia, Colombia is definitely experiencing this tragedy. This country located in one of the most biologically rich regions of our planet, where deforestation and degradation of natural resources is intensifying. And unsustainable extraction of both flora and fauna is commonplace. So bottom line, from a global perspective, the world needs hope. And it's time that sustainability became the mainstream driver for what we're making and how we're making our decisions. Our choices and what we decide to produce, how we decide to produce it, and from what source we, we buy it, are real, and those choices have impact. And that impact is global. The world needs bright lights and resilient solutions in which to point to. So how does that tie back to our conversation today? The International Panel on Climate Change is clear that sustainable forest management is part of the global climate solution. Wood is the most renewable and carbon-friendly building material on the planet, and I recognize that saying that in this room of resources um, is maybe a controversial point, but it is a renewable resource, and it's one that we have to value and treasure. And British Columbia has every opportunity to shine as leaders in this regard, to meaningfully and tangibly contribute to global climate change solutions, and demonstrate to the world and to future generations how our systems, our laws, our businesses, have evolved to better con uh, contribute to the long-term management of healthy, resilient, and renewable forests. We should be proud of our leadership in sustainable forest management and take credit for our accomplishments, recognize our shortfalls, and our professional practices to understand the advancements that we've made. So while we focus on continuously changing, adapting, questioning, and sometimes even criticizing ourselves for not doing enough, we shouldn't lose sight of the global perspective and if, as if we do, we'll make the wrong choices and in peril jurisdictions, their natural environments, and impoverished people will increasingly pay the price. So I am hopeful that through conversations like this, where we focus on what it takes to be global leaders in sustainability,
that we can transcend borders and escape local politics, accept our challenge and responsibility to be global leaders and global solutions providers in a shared commitment to the sustainable management of BC's forest. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Kurt. Thanks, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I just want to start off by saying, uh, uh, talking a little bit about Kofi. Uh, we represent uh, the, the, most of the producers in British Columbia. Um, all of our uh, producers uh, are committed to a sustainable uh, forest management. Um, ultimately, we produce a range of products. We're going through a lot of challenges right now, but we, we believe there is a, a bright future ahead, which I'll, I'd like to touch on. First of all, I'm an economist, so I'll start off with some economic facts. Uh, the forest sector still has a, quite a substantial uh, economic footprint uh, in British Columbia. Um, we support over 100,000 direct and indirect jobs. Uh, one third of our BC's exports are forest products. Uh, the challenges that we're seeing right now uh, are related uh, to cost. We, we used to be the low cost producer and we've moved up the, the, the cost curve in the, in the global market. Um, and that's, that's been driven by a few different things. Uh, one of the key things is related to, to declining timber supply. Um, our, our economic or our milling capacity was exceeding the sustainable supply and that, that needed to come down. Uh, and before that uh, happened, uh, prices were being driven up because the, there was this excess demand uh, for fiber. And so I think over time you'll see a balance in, in terms of prices. We need to look at uh, doing things better and doing things more cost uh, effective. Um, but ultimately, uh, in terms of the question at hand about sustainability, uh, it's not just about economics, it's, it's uh, about balance. It's about uh, balancing economics and social uh, and environmental uh, values. Um, and, and so uh, the industry is cognizant of that and, and we want to, to, to be sustainable. And ultimately, I think that is a, a good business decision. I think it will be rewarded in the marketplace. Um, but, and so what we've uh, uh, outlined in, is a, in our smart future document is a, a path to a, a competitive and sustainable future uh, in British Columbia. And it really has uh, sort of five components. Uh, the first one is about uh, protecting and uh, investing in our working force. Um, secondly, we, we need to um, look at doing things uh, in a smarter way. Um, we, we all agree that we, we want to be uh, leaders in environmental and sustainable uh, um, uh, management, um, but we need to be smart about that. We need to streamline things, focus on outcomes, and, and try to do that in a, in a cost-effective way. Uh, thirdly, we need to strengthen our indigenous partnerships. Uh, we, we support uh, increased revenue sharing uh, with indigenous uh, partners, uh, also with communities. Uh, I think we, uh, the uh, provincial government can step up and, and uh, lead uh, more in that area. Uh, fourthly, um, we, we need to diversify our um, products um, and uh, our markets, and so looking at uh, producing different products, green energy, uh, more value-added production, uh, looking at CLT production and so forth, um, which other people, including the Premier, uh, touched on. Um, and also uh, looking at different markets. We, we've traditionally been uh, dependent on the U.S. Uh, that's always been uh, a source of contention, uh, that, that trade flow. And there's, bit, there's emerging markets. Um, uh, there's, I think a lot of people know about the story of, Ch of China emerging, uh, but other emerging markets uh, and growing our markets uh, elsewhere. And then finally, um, to become a, a, a real leader in terms of uh, green building and using more wood. Uh, and I think that's uh, something that's just emerging and in, in thinking about issues about climate change, forestry has a, a key role to play in, in that area. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Thanks. Kurt. Uh, the document that Kurt mentioned, the Path Forward document, if you haven't had a chance to uh, read it yet, I would definitely recommend uh, reading it. I think it's a very, there was a lot of thought uh, and contributions from the industry that went into putting that document together. You can get it on the Kofi website, and they probably have some copies at the booth uh, out in the, the trade show floor that you can visit at, at Kofi. So maybe now we'll turn it over to uh, taking some questions from Pigeonhole. 
Uh, I see that the kind of probably our top two trending questions are, are quite similar. For those that were here on uh, thir or I guess Tuesday night, you would have heard Bruce Anderson speaking um, about the abacus poll that really was looking at the resource sectors uh, and, and what was happening in, in the sectors. And so one of the trends we did see was great enthusiasm uh, to support BC's sustainably produced resource products. And so really, what, what does that look like for the forest industry? What, what you know, Shannon, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Kurt, you touched on it a little bit too with the green building products. Um, but maybe Shannon, do you wanna jump in on that one first? Sure, yeah, I think, you know, this is a great question and it's certainly one that, you know, uh, I'm passionate about. So when you look at, you know, the opportunity in British Columbia, uh, we have tremendous forest. Um, you know, I, I, oper I work on the coast um, and that's where uh, my, my experience has been. I know that the interior uh, mountain pine beetle has, has taken a toll. Uh, I understand that, you know, as a, a society, we made some choices. We made some choices over the last 20 years that, you know, we're, we're seeing the, the, some of the impacts of those today. Um, we can look back on those choices and decide uh, they were right or they were wrong, but we actually have to look forward. And I think that's our opportunity here, is the sustainability of our forests and the, and the resource that we have in play we have a tremendous opportunity. And the more I travel, the more I look around the world, the more I see that we have something to show the rest of the world. Uh, once I pitched internally a, um, an idea that we should really just say that, you know, what, why does uh, British Columbia not have sad, angry elephants and unemployed elephants? And everyone says, well, because we don't have elephants. Well, no, the answer is, when we look at Thailand, for example, why are there elephants unemployed? Well, they actually, um, logged a lot of their uh, forests and never reforested. And so you flash forward to where we are today, and there is very little forest in that country, and you have sad, angry, ele unemployed elephants for a reason. And it's because they don't have a job. Uh, whether they should have had that job to begin with is another thing, but I look at what our opportunity, what we can bring from a reforestation perspective, what we've learned in British Columbia, we need to be proud of those accomplishments so that we can actually step into the world stage and actually so, show where those solutions sit. Yes, we have problems. Yes, British Columbia has uh, suffered some tremendous uh, um, uh, shortfalls in terms of the mountain pine bill and in terms of climate change on those forests, but we also need to look ahead and we also need to show the world what we've done, what we've learned, and be proud of that. Yeah, I'll just, uh, that's a great point, Shannon. I, I would also echo just in, in focus in on the, on the carbon story. I think that's a, a great uh, a story for forestry. And uh, it's in thinking, uh, really, climate change is a global uh, issue. Uh, and forestry has a, and forest products have, have a, a key role to play in um, reducing our carbon footprint. Um, but others are, are going to be uh, attempting to do that as well. And so I think that just uh, emphasizes that we need to do it in a, in a cost competitive way uh, and, and in a smart, sustainable way. Any other comments? Yeah, I didn't know that my opening statement was supposed to be positive. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, He didn't give but, you that message. <laughs> but some of, some of the questions in here are getting to the heart of, of this issue. And, and, you know, I agree with the sentiment that we need to uh, look forward. Uh, so at, at the city level, we have taken this on with an initiative we call the Future Forestry Think Tank. We started in May in 2018 in the absence of what we saw as, as any kind of leadership. Uh, that was going to help us with that. And the question we're asking is, okay, so the landscape is where the landscape's at. What's the rehabilitation strategy for that landscape that brings us back to ecological resiliency so that landscape isn't as susceptible to those large-scale disturbances that are there? And if we can figure that out in a collective way with First Nations industry, uh, community partners, labor sitting at the table, uh, and trying to figure that out, then we can ask the economic question. So then we can say, okay, if that's what eco ecological resiliency looks like, what is the extractive value and what does the manufacturing sector have to pivot to to take advantage of that? 
and our industry is, is part of that process. So I do believe that we can have a bright future, but I don't believe we can have a bright future by glossing over the kind of the, the real challenges we have in front of us just now. It's only by embracing those challenges that we can actually pivot to have a brighter future. Yeah, I mean, we talk about uh, the sustainability of the forestry sector, and it's not a new topic of discussion. I mean, it dates back into the early 90s. Um, you know, people were making hay over the years. We look at our, our traditional territory in the Williams Lake area, and I mean, there was massive clear cuts that are going on. Those visual barriers weren't there. You know, um, it opened up the landscape and caused a, a number of other issues that um, we're dealing with to, to this day and we're getting better at it. But when we first started talking about it in the early 90s, you know, I was 10 years old and I couldn't comprehend anything that was being um, explained to me back then. But, um, I mean, we, we weren't looking far enough ahead and, and looking at future generations on, on, on how we're going to deal with this when they take over the helm. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, but we look at the, the, the polls and, and shedding light on it now is, is our attention is turned to it and mills are shutting down. There's a lot more urgency there. I mean, so there's, there's positives, I guess. I mean, that would be really one of the biggest positives is now everybody's talking about it and everybody wants to deal with it and, and, and look at it into the future. So my kids are going to be able to potentially work in the forest industry. Um, my dad's a logger, he's still a logger, and I mean, that's how he paid the bills growing up. And um, I can, you know, proudly say that, that that's one of the reasons why I am where I'm at today is those forestry dollars. So, I mean, it's an economy that's, that's struggling, but a lot of people rely on, including this great province and even this, this country for that matter. But as we shed more light on it, I mean, we start focusing on more, you know, of that partnership piece of it. I mean, Mayor Simpson talked about it, uh, and including the First Nations as part of that discussion. You know, we see one of the questions, the, the, the leading question, uh, how will UNDRIP affect confidence in forestry? I mean, like, I spoke at the UNDRIP conference a couple of weeks ago, and, and we, we talk about how it continues to get thrown around in these instances. Yeah, we might as well just segue yeah. right into <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly where I was going to go, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it... It's about diversifying, I guess. Uh, how, how are we <clears throat> continuing to contribute to the sustainability of the forestry industry? I mean, we're striking up partnerships with the city of Williams Lake, for example. The community forest that we have with them is uh, one of the biggest success stories that the Williams Lake Indian Band has in, the, in, in, in previous years. <clears throat> we're looking at alternative ways to keep our equipment working, like, um, you know, biomass energy projects, for example, and looking at chipping and, and working with uh, Pinnacle Pellet and, and Atlantic Power and Williams Lake. Uh, how are we helping them contribute as well? And, you know, instead of burning those piles out in the bush, we're chipping those piles and shipping them in the town. But, I mean, those, they're just not feasible to run without subsidies. I mean, we look at the FESBC funding is subsidizing the trucking costs in those initiatives uh, because uh, their, you know, historical logging practices don't make them feasible. So uh, how do we change the way that we log in the bush to um, utilize that timber more efficiently so that we get more out of it? You know, I talk about those visual barriers that we've seen in the clear cuts in the previous years. And I drive down Redoux Lake Road, for example, and I mean, a lot of that regen is coming back. Um, the visual barriers along the road, I guess, um, mitigate the landscape so it doesn't look like a clear, clear cut. But, you know, I don't remember the last time I seen a moose in my territory. I mean, I wrote a children's book, Dip Netting with Dad, so I guess you can say I'm more of a fisherman than anything. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's not just how we deal with, I guess, the, the stems, but also, you know, the foliage that's there, the, 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 the grasslands, the... Um, the wildlife, you know, I mean, there's a lot of contributing factors in how we sustain our, the, the forestry sector. And, um, you know, one of the things that the elders are always pressing, pressing upon me is, you know, how do we protect our medicine, our malum and our berries, um, those gathering areas that we historically have been frequenting um, since time immemorial, uh, just aren't there anymore. You know, they've been logged over. And, and including First Nations in that discussion through the implementation of UNDRIP in a more meaningful way is, is, is a big part of how we're going to get there, in my opinion. 
uh, even the, like the C Club, the Caribou Chilcotin land use plan. I mean, there was no for, there was no First Nations input on that plan. How do we uh, crack that back open and 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 critique and, and and review that with First Nation inclusion, not just from the Williams Lake Indian Band, but I mean First Nations across the board. Um, as the AAC is coming down, I mean it's becoming a big part of the discussion. We're seeing forest the forestry leaders in our community and Williams like coming to the table wanting to have a chat about how they can partner up with the local First Nations to um, you know keep their business alive and, and, and those meaningful partnerships you know with the city I mean it doesn't even stop there I mean we have great relationships with uh, industry right across the board Mount Pauly um, Gibraltar uh, you know Altec on the on the on the power side I mean everything is molding in and contributing to um, that undrip discussion and it all flows back to, I mean, where those grassroots were, that's that forestry industry. Mm -hmm. I look at, um, you know, some powerful statements from the most famous chief of the Williams Lake Indian Band, Chief William, and, you know, he, he sent some correspondence to the government at the time, and they, what they wanted was land. It was in 1879, so it's not something that we haven't been asking for um, just recently. I mean, we've been asking for that since the 1800s. And we look at, um, you know, the memorial to Sir Wilfrid Laurier. And when the settlers were coming in, they were saying, your, your land um, is very rich, and, and, and we want to celebrate that with you. We want to, you know, work with you on this. And the First Nation leaders at the time, um, they were, their expectations were 50-50. I mean, that's what they're telling their people. That's what they're telling their leaders. And, I mean, that's not where we're at now. The implementation of UNDRIP is, is, is allowing us to gain some ground for sure, but I mean, there's still a lot of ground to be gained, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments on, on UNDRIP? Sure. Sure. I, I think, you know, your comments are, are great, and I, I think every place in reconciliation, there's a different story, and those stories are emerging. And it's an exciting time. I, I think the UNDRIP, um, or DRIPA, I guess, legislation, has put something in front of us, which has provided us an opportunity to figure it out together. Um, I, I've, I, I'm very excited about what that means. Um, I've seen the opportunities in our own uh, working environment uh, where we've had uh, very meaningful discussions um, that have changed from, you know, how do we engage, um, how do we consult to, how do we work together, how do we partner, how do we have equity ownership, real, true, meaningful, uh, in-depth relationships, and I think that is uh, absolutely necessary as we look forward. I think it's an incredibly great opportunity for sustainable forest management, for land-based management. Um, I think the opportunity for those partnerships, for that true true and equal um, uh, ownership and equity within businesses is, is coming into play, and I'm excited about the future. It's created the environment for those conversations, and I think there will be uh, um, probably 150 of them occurring across the, the, uh, uh, the province going forward. So. Well, maybe going back to uh, pigeonhole, uh, Another leading question back to one of the comments that Mayor Simpson made about the high cost jurisdiction that we, that we operate in, and I don't think there's anyone in the industry who would disagree with that. Uh, so how can we take advantage of the green building opportunity if we can't compete, and, and what do we need to do? And so maybe Kurt, maybe I'd start with you from that economic perspective. Um, you know, what, what do you see as those kind of economic challenges, and how do we need to make some adjustments in the industry? Yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, the, the one point there was that if we can't compete, and I think we just, we need to compete, whether that is in uh, traditional commodity pro uh, products or in uh, newer emerging products, uh, we need to be competitive in, in those. Um, the other jurisdiction, jurisdictions are going to be uh, seizing that opportunity as well. And so I think it just comes back to trying to do things uh, in an innovative manner and focusing on, you know, trying to streamline uh, whatever uh, unnecessary regulation is there so that we can uh, be cost competitive. And, and I think uh, that will lead to opportunities in, in both traditional and uh, new emerging green products. Bob, did you have some additional comments to kind of expand on that point? I, I think we're going to have difficulty in a shrinking log supply of getting on top of the cost 
uh, and get back to the good old days of, of being a low cost uh, producer. And I just had a meeting with Wes Fraser a little while ago um, and I, I did come out of Weldwood and uh, I was a, an organizational change internal consultant and some of the folks sitting around the table at West Fraser were folks that I was their leadership coach uh, during the time that they were with Weldwood, so it's <laughs> interesting to be sitting with them now. Uh, but one of the things, uh, you know, to the point on the economics is we have to understand that in a shrinking uh, log supply, the companies are as much responsible for driving log cost up as, as anybody else, right? On how they bid and, and, and because the market was high, uh, they were overbidding the pricing uh, and that led to the current stumpage system. So, so the culpability of, of, you know, how do we price those logs rests in the bidding system and all the regulatory framework that we've got that has to be looked at through the lens of SLA. But the true answer for British Columbia, in my estimation, is getting up the margin uh, chain, getting up the value chain, getting higher margin products out of that shrinking timber supply. And that's the conversation that we're trying to have at our think tank process. It's the conversation uh, that a number of mayors had with the premier and the minister of forest and Ravi uh, last week. And I think what government needs to do is work with industry to roadmap how we move up that value chain. So how do we get away from dimension lumber products to mass timber, LVL, CLT, and all of those things? How does BC make that pivot? On the biodigesting side, because there's questions in here about climate change, on the biodigesting side, we have the answer to weaning ourselves off petrochemicals. Uh, we can make products uh, from wood and wood fiber that are direct substitutes for petrochemical products. And when the world is talking about getting away from single-use uh, plastics, there's a question begged of what are their substitutes. The answer is biosubstitutes, and our wood industry can make those. So one of the fundamental questions we've asked government is, can we take a look at that shrinking AAC and ask one fundamental question, how can we extract more value without more, putting more pressure on the harvesting land base? In our case, for example, caribou pulp and paper could add a lignin extraction plant. It's currently a waste product. They burn it. Lignin now is finding more and more market uh, uh, share uh, in a variety of products, glues, etc. No more logs are required to do that. We burn that waste. That's a plant that could put 30 jobs in the community of Cornell today. We have another pulp mill that could switch to biocomposites instead of pulp and make every product that's currently in our cars just now that are made from petrochemical products. They can make the chemical soup that's the feedstock for those products. How do we pivot them? So from the dimension lumber, you know, kind of low-end American market, to mass timber products and alternate products, and on the biodigesting side, moving away from a default to pellets and power and into biocomposites, if we have that roadmap, mm -hmm. then I think the government's regulatory regime, incentive regime, partnerships with First Nations and everybody else has a place that focuses of where we need to go. Without the roadmap, I think we're just going to keep floundering and keep beating ourselves up about what's happened in the past. And, needing less regulation and less static reserves on the land base, I think it's the wrong conversation. We need a different conversation. Mm -hmm. I think the government can definitely provide a roadmap, but ultimately the, I think the marketplace is, will uh, organically uh, shift into those different products. Uh, there, I think there is a role to provide some incentives. Uh, I'd caution about, um, I think government has a tendency to regulate when it wants to uh, uh, create a, a certain outcome, um, and I think you, we can encourage certain outcomes more through incentives. So you're meant, uh, talking about uh, on the bio, bio uh, mass side of things, and so uh, we, we um, encourage more uh, an approach instead of a regulatory framework, maybe a tax credit. Um, these are sort of options that would to help to encourage and incent new, new production. So just one quick point on that, though. Absolutely. I think the market is out there and fledgling, but the incentives are critical. We missed a lignin plant in British Columbia. It went to Hinton, Alberta. West Fraser didn't want to build it there because BC did not have an incentive program to match the federal incentive program. So even simple things like that, where you come in, where it makes sense to come in, uh, I agree with you. Don't try to regulate an, you know, a, a new industry into existence, but that combination of scoping the market working between all of the partners to say what's the roadmap and then aligning 
yourself, incentives, regulation, et cetera, to achieve that goal, I think is the answer forward. Mm -hmm. Shannon, any comments on, on that yeah, area? No, I think you've covered it for sure. I think the incentive piece in the marketplace has to be considered um, to ensure, um, as you're, I mean, capital is fluid. It comes uh, across borders and people are choosing what technologies to invest in and in where to invest those dollars. Um, in the absence of an operating environment or that's conducive to try things new and to be on the bleeding edge, um, you've got to have that market there or you've got to have some incentives in place for people to want to invest their money. Mm -hmm. uh, well, apparently we are starting to run out of time. So we'll go to one last question and I'm going to keep to the positive view of the, the future going forward. So uh, what's the single most thing that you are inspired about when you envision a bright future for the forest industry? And, and maybe Chief Sellers, I'll start with you. Yeah, <clears throat> I think meaningful partnerships with First Nations is a big one. Being a partner at that table, um, you know, and, and I think collaboration not only just with uh, local governments and regional districts, but provincial governments and even uh, bringing in the feds. You talk about those incentive programs that um, aren't being matched by the province. I mean, that's something that should be very carefully considered when we look at those economic opportunities that could potentially come to these rural towns that really rely on forestry. You know, like it's, it's forcing these rural towns to, to diversify and, and like really look at how they're going to drive jobs into the region, how they're going to drive revenue into the region and, 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 and want people to invest and move there. I mean, we have a, co a commercial residential development project uh, on our reserve lands just outside the city of Williams Lake. And our focus is always not just the Williams Lake Indian Band and what we're doing, but what we're doing with the city of Williams Lake, what we're doing with the Caribou Regional District, our relationships with the provincial MLA, Donna Barnett, our, our relationship with our federal MP, uh, Todd Doherty. I mean, those conversations are continuously happening. I mean, we have their ear and their lobbying for stuff that's going on in our region. And I mean, that's the way that we have to go, but not only just with building those relationships, but also you know, having a seat at the table and being able to properly plan on how we do this. Um, you know, the, the stumpage fiasco that we're, we're, we're in now and has is, is caused a lot of these problems is because the market was so high and people were bidding that wood, expecting that it was never going to come down. I'm not sure. I mean, it's such short-term thinking on this stuff. Let's, um, let's look at what that long game is. I mean, it's those relationships that are um, getting built with uh, the partners that are going to be still sticking around in the region long after industry is gone. I mean, we're, we're having a coffee this morning, me and Bob, and we were talking about, you know, the licenses that are currently in those small towns and, you know, like what if a Tolco leaves or a West Fraser leaves? Um, I mean, they take those licenses with them. How are they not, um, you know, transferred over and, and staying in, 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 the, in the region? You know, like I'm not a technical guy. I'm not a, a forestry expert by any means. I mean, I got a great technical staff that really informs me and, uh, you know, helps our council make the best, best possible decision on stuff like this. And um, just looking broad strokes and going back to my opening comment, it's, um, you know, giving us a meaningful seat at the table mm -hmm. um, and, and continuing to build and foster those relationships with your neighbors and with your partners. Great. Bob? Yeah, and I, I do think there is huge opportunity in the forest sector, and particularly in British Columbia, to pave the way forward on weaning ourselves off of the petrochemical uh, economy that we know is not sustainable uh, long term. Uh, as, a, as a council, uh, we established a forestry innovation center in City Hall, uh, and uh, that's a, an incubation hub for us. We have two full-time staff. Uh, we've been able to staff it with uh, various grants that we've cobbled together. Next week, we start our landscape planning. We're a landscape uh, planning pilot uh, designated by the provincial government that blends into our think tank process. So we have two days to kick that off. And we're doing a lot of work with FP Innovations, FII, with the Finnish uh, uh, research uh, team as well, Laval University, et cetera, to look at the manufacturing side. And one of the th keys that we have in Quenelle is we still are a huge manufacturing hub. Uh, we have two pulp mills. We have a pa uh, two panels. We have uh, one of the largest sawmills in the world. We have CNC wood products, Dunkley, to the north of us. So we think we're in a really good position to ask the landscape question, and then we have enough deployed resources 
uh, and enough really innovative partners to start the pivot on the manufacturing sector. So I'm really hopeful. I think as a forest-dependent community, we want to remain a forest-dependent community for the foreseeable future. Uh, and we're not, we're not sort of diversifying away from. We want to actually diversify within and see that whole sector continue to be our, our main base uh, for many generations to come. Great. Shannon. Great. Um, I would say locally or in British Columbia, as excited as I am about wood products and the opportunity globally to be the bright light, I also see opportunities uh, here in British Columbia at this point in our time um, for bright light solutions to come out as well. Um, there is a lot of tension. There's a lot of fear. Um, there's a lot of fear that things are unraveling, but there's also those bright lights that show us the path. When it comes to partnerships with First Nations, um, to demonstrate how it works, um, to get to a place where it works for business and it works for First Nations in a reconciliation uh, place, and those bright lights show us that path. And we're in a place where I think that a lot of innovation is going to occur. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people step forward uh, to demonstrate how we can make this work at this point in our time so that we can start, uh, stop being afraid and start being really optimistic about our future. Um, so I'm excited about that because I think the next couple of years will bring that for us. And I, I think that a lot of people uh, in this room will be the ones delivering it. Thanks, Shannon. I would agree with the sentiments uh, said by the other panelists. Um, I, I'd say the um, one thing that I would uh, sort of uh, key in on is um, the one thing about forestry is it's a renewable resource. And I think uh, as we um, sort of look out at globally, uh, again, in the context of uh, looking at uh, reducing our carbon footprint, uh, that that's going to lend uh, itself to be, uh, 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 you know, lend itself to a, a bright future going forward. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, to have this discussion. I think we covered a lot of, a lot of territory and had a lot of uh, a variety of uh, opinions and thoughts. And it's interesting to hear the, the, the focuses and, and areas that, uh, you know, from the First Nations to the community to the companies where people, where people are focused. And I continue to be optimistic about the industry. I continue to think that we're going to be able to, you know, keep that path forward, that Quinnell is going to be able to continue to be a forestry-dependent community 50 and 100 years down the road. But I think it is about working together and that cooperative approach. So thank you very much, everyone, for showing, sharing your opinions and thoughts today. Thanks.